for Okay, beautiful. Welcome, folks, to the Hyperledger Supply Chain and Trade Finance Special Interest Group regularly scheduled session. Today, we have Alex Style from Venturis will be uh, sharing uh, some thoughts with us. We're looking forward to that. So before we get going, um, welcome to everybody. See a few people, uh, some names that uh, recognize, like Mr. Odie. Thank you for joining Uh Akila, uh, thanks for joining also. So that's uh, great. And Gijo Joseph. Uh, so folks will keep on coming on. We are recording this. It'll be up on uh, YouTube, uh, usually by the afternoon. Uh, so if you want, you can share it with other people and we'll let folks know about it. Um, since we're part of Hyperledger here, a uh, few housekeeping items. Uh, all are welcome. This is an open session here. We're glad that you're all here, uh, as well as you're listening on or watching on uh, YouTube uh, in the future. In addition, uh, from an antitrust perspective, again, we're an open community here. Please don't share anything confidential that you don't want anybody else to know about since this is an open community. So let's see here what we have. Upcoming events, we got this one. You see a few events here um, coming up outside of Hyperledger. Uh, we do have a presentation. I think Farm to Plate um, is going to be presenting in the middle of uh, June on uh, one of these sessions. So uh, let's see here. With that, Alex, I'm going to stop sharing and then allow you to bring your um, charts up while I introduce you. So Alex is the Director of Business Development for Venturis. He actually, on the About page, you can see his uh, great picture there and a little bit about him. Venturis has been around since 2019. They're based in the Netherlands. Um, so with that, um, I, I'm interested. I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion from Alex. Alex, are you able to bring things up? Yep, uh, I'm just about to share the screen right now. Okay. Everything's moving quite it, slowly. So looking busy. forward to it here um, around traceability and transparency and what they can bring to the table here. And oh, by the way, good news, they use Hyperledger. So even better, which is why you're here, Alex. Yes, indeed. indeed. Um, I'm uh, very excited. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me clearly, by the way? Yes, yes. perfectly. Yes. Okay, so uh, while Alex is bringing those, I'll, I'll uh, do a little commercial here for uh, our 2024 project. Last year we had the ebook, and uh, it is, I mentioned this previously, that's still getting a lot of traction. I know people are downloading. Jeff, I, I, I saw your note about people uh, hearing about it and starting furiously downloading it. So that's great with all sorts of uh, supply chain trade finance uh, applications there. Um, and it's getting translated still into multiple languages. 2024 project is uh, around blogs um, and writing six of them, hopefully around topics that are appropriate for supply chain and trade finance. And so we're kicking off uh, here shortly. Alicia is working on one around traceability. And so she might be reaching out to some people and uh, some other folks have at, uh, signed up. Uh, Ned Thompson's going to do one around trade finance. And I think there were a couple others here, but uh, th there's openings to do. Oh, we're going to do one around IoT also. So uh, if you're interested in helping out with those, or we're not trying to make them long books. So and probably the next session will be a discussion around uh, where we are on those and, and kind of diving down a little bit deeper on the topics. So oops, Alex, I see you. He's you back on. There we go. I tried to share and it, it suddenly dropped. Let me try again. Okay. Oh man. <laughs> just send us the presentation if you drop, okay? And then just come on back. Okay. That's looking pretty good. 
Okay, that's come up. It all says it started screen sharing, but the rest of it hasn't happened yet. Okay. Ah, there you my go. Screen is there, is the, there, beautiful. Oh, there you go. Alex, it's all there yours. Thank you very much. And thank you again for, for having me. So um, today, um, I'm really going to talk about Venturis as a business. Um, and what we do um, when it comes to our how we've used Hyperledger and, and sort of the deep tech side, um, that's that's slightly beyond my ken. Um, but I also have a, a, a clear understanding of how it works enough for the for the business side, but also why we selected Hyperledger. So I'll first run us through um, why we went with Hyperledger and, and and the benefits that we see, and then really how we use this um, in a business. Cool. And Alex, I actually so, forgot to ask you a question. Would you would you like questions along the way, or do you want to held to the end? I think um, at the end is probably best. But if there's a particularly pressing one, feel free to stick a hand up. I'm more than happy to answer it as we go. Okay, there you go, folks. You can if you have one, maybe put it in chat, and then yep. we can bring it bring it at the end, unless it's uh, particularly pressing, as Alex says. And Alex, for some reason. The screen keeps on getting refreshed. I'm not sure what's going on, but we haven't had this issue. Um, It'll go black for like, maybe that's just me. Alicia, are you seeing that or Jeff? I'm seeing it too, but also- Oh, uh, I was experiencing that earlier. You probably saw my video go out and then come back and go out and come back. So something with Zoom, I don't know. Yeah, but- I mean, we've now. lost it now. Yeah, the screen's black. Akila, you mm -hmm. said something. You're getting it too. Yeah, I was saying that we have a black screen. It's a black screen. Yeah, okay. I I got the black screen. So, Alex, uh, <laughs> I don't know it's what's bad. going on. Here. Okay. Um, now it's good. Right, I'm gonna stop. Well, now it's out. So once in a while I get a okay. message from I'm, Zoom telling me that my video is still loading, my background video is still loading. I have no idea what that is. Yeah, I've had that all of today. It's been really problematic. Um, and I had it on Teams as well, so I'm not sure what's happening. Um, well, Alicia, do you mind if I send you the presentation and then maybe you can cast it? And I don't know if it's my bandwidth that's, sure. that's not working properly. If you want to email that to me, then I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Okay, and then we'll, Alex will let you talk as soon as you press send. And since I'll have it, I want to ask permission. May we share this with the group after the meeting, share it on the meeting wiki page? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry, folks, the technical difficulties. I'm waiting for the email. We've, not had, we, we've been doing pretty well here. We've not had any problems for like ages. I know. So this now, is can you stop the stop the recording? Can you stop recording and restart it if you want? But then he'll have to do the introduction again. We can also edit it out. Edit on the okay. black break. We'll we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll do some editing here. Folks don't need to hear me talk again. It's still not in my inbox. I keep hitting refresh. Okay, Alex. One yeah, no, I, I, I haven't been able to send it because it's. Okay. Also, you could just drop it into the chat for here if you want to. Whichever is easiest. I'm sorry. I'm going to send it right now. So I'll send you a PDF if that's okay. Sure. That's what I'll usually distribute when I'm presenting. Actually, reduces yeah. the likelihood it'll get edited. Alex you know, looks frozen there. You guys seeing that too? 
Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, the head just moved. Alex, I don't know if you're hearing us, but I think your your connection uh, is freezing a bit. I can hear you. Okay. We can hear you, but when you just spoke, we didn't see your mouth move on the video. It's still static. Oh, yeah. You might want to okay, turn on your video okay. now and then just start talking. Yeah. Oh, now, it's, now it looks like it's moving again. Now it looks better. Yeah, okay. I think it was, there's a particularly chunky um, PowerPoint and that was slowing everything down. Not sure what's going on anyway. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, close, Alex, or is it better to um, talk and then without the charts? Uh, quite hard because a lot of visualization that needs to needs to happen. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, let me know if you can see that. I think this should be. Yes, okay, we can yeah. see it. Yeah. Okay, helps. It's doing okay. the same okay. blacking out kind of thing. Same again. I, I I can see it now. Okay, let's go. Is it is it coming in and out? No, it's it, staying, staying it, it did it once, but yeah. now it's solid. So let's go. Okay. Uh, okay, right. Well, there we go. Um, so yeah, um, Venturus was uh, was founded in 2017, but really this project started in 2017. We've been with Hyperledger from the very beginning. Um, and uh, what we do is we digitize and secure multimodal supply chains, and we do so using private blockchain. And we selected uh, Hyperledger Fabric to be the, the platform on which we built that. You can still hear me all right? Yeah. I can hear you, but... I Alicia, Jeff, are you seeing it flashing? Yeah, I, uh, I've been, I've been taking notes, so. Again, I can um, still see the presentation. It's flashing a little bit, but I'm still seeing it enough where it's not, yeah. Joe's just, just yeah. posted it's probably okay. a bandwidth so issue. You could switch off your video. Yeah, I'll turn down my, my video as well, just to reduce overall for the call. And now it looks stable. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Alicia, I'm sending you the presentation because I think that's what's doing it. I don't know what's going on with my computer. I'm okay. sorry. We'll... No, it's okay. And Alex, Alexis mentioned that you were traveling now as well, so that could that could be. I'm, I'm actually home and I'm on very good Wi-Fi, so I don't know what's going on. Welcome. You're in New York City and you have good Wi-Fi? You're very lucky. Most of us don't. Uh, I'm in the UK, but still. <laughs> okay. Okay. Have you sent I'm down? Sorry for all of this. That's okay. Okay, that should have been sent. Yeah, that's sent. So that'll okay. that come online. I am obsessively. Uh, I'm sorry, whoever by. do the editing. Uh, I... You know, let's take one more shot here, and if not, let's re let's reschedule. Yeah. One inbox. Yeah. You got it now. I rarely yeah. refresh my email this obsessively. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, there, there it is. Got it. Okay. Okay. It's downloading. It must be a large file. Yeah, it is. It is quite large. That's why I put it into PDF, but then it didn't give me the option to send you the PDF. So mm. I don't know what's happening. Okay. And Maria Munara just joined. Is this the Venturas call? Yes, it is. Welcome, Maria. Just a few te technical difficulties here. Yes. Thank you. I was just joining late, so I didn't want to interrupt. You were probably actually the, the smart one. <laughs> <Might as well. laughs> You're living right, Maria. Like the rest of us. We got technical demon demons uh, getting us. Uh, it came through as a PowerPoint, not a PDF. Okay, Alicia. Just... Yeah, that's right. It wouldn't give me the option to send the PDF. Oh, that's odd. Okay. I'm okay. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this so I got it. it with... Pardon, Alex? There's something going on with my Mac, and so it's not airing stuff correctly. I think that's why the um, the screen share was was getting like that. Okay, I I'm about to share a screen. Since I'm going to be sharing the screen, it probably doesn't make sense for me to um, for me to take notes during the meeting. Jeff, can I ask you to take notes during the meeting? No. No. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Okay. Thank you. We're going along here. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, make this bigger. Funny, I usually use uh, the Apple. Um, that should. I usually use that. that should. I can't hear you. Put it in slideshow mode. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. I just. Yeah. I, I usually use a different <laughs> software, so I'm forgetting where where that is right now. Down in the bottom, go over one more. To it the should right. be down in the bottom there right. There we go. Right. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Can everyone see? Yep. Okay. So um, from the top, I guess. Um, so yeah. Um, at Venturis, we've been. Um, what we do is we digitize and secure multimodal supply chain chains and we use private blockchain for that um, and we are using hyperledger from the very beginning um, so what i'm going to do in this session is going to really run through initially a sort of broad overview of of what we've done using hyperledger and why we chose hyperledger and then dive into the business side uh, which is really where i come from um, and and run you through how we're using Hyperledger and, and uh, the Hyperledger fabric in a practical application um, for Venturus. And we say built by the industry for the industry. So our, um, our founder, Hostling Mast, um, had a very interesting, uh, very interesting background in the sense that he's a proper techie, uh, someone who really understands um, and someone who's very interested in blockchain and uh, has all of the technical know-how to build this from, from the ground up. But also, he came from a logistics background um, and understood the aches and the problems in that uh, people face in supply chain logistics. Um, and so, he was uniquely positioned to use um, blockchain for that uh, that use case, which is why we say by the industry for the industry. Um, would you mind moving to the next slide? Oops. So. Is this the right one? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so in the uh, in the industry, what we see as the biggest challenge is a lack of. Hello. If you could put yourself on mute, if you're. Can everyone? Gonna... Go ahead, Alex. Okay. Um, so the the what we see in in the industry, and this is in any form of supply chain and logistics is a structural lack of interoperability and of real-time supply chain traceability. So interoperability is really starting to become a buzzword now, um, but it's it's taken time for people to realize quite how important this is. So interoperability, meaning that everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet, essentially everyone's operating from the same set of facts, and they're getting that information as soon as it's available. So everyone connected to everyone 
and, and sharing relevant data in real time. Um, and so what we do as our interoperable network solution is we connect all systems, functionalities, essentially ev anyone in a supply chain or a logistics chain. And that could be internal systems. It can also be external third parties. It could even be governmental bodies. Um, we connect everyone together into a network and essentially create in its purest form interoperability for supply chain and trace uh, and uh, logistics traceability. And so the impact of this is that we can share we can make sure that for your network of um, uh, of third party internal systems for your supply chain, there is real time of actionable data. At the moment, there's a lot of email, a lot of phone calls. You wouldn't believe quite how manually the uh, global supply chain works. What we do is we harmonize everything by connecting them into a, a blockchain network. Um, and essentially, everyone wins from this network effect because everyone gets better information in real time. Uh, next slide. So we are at the moment the only solution of our kind in, in the space that we're in. Um, so we're, we're a network solution, but really when, when we're um, meeting clients and speaking with, uh, with potential clients, Inevitably, we get compared to a traditional TMS system or a visibility platform um, who have been pretty popular in the last few years. And so what we say is that we are quite different um, and we're not actually a platform, we're a solution. So it's you can see there on the left, um, I'm not sure why that line's missing, my apologies, um, that each of those smaller circles represents a party in the supply chain or logistics exchange. And with a visibility platform, they integrate with all of them, they pull the data in, but they just provide that information and that data and that visibility to one person. And that is the client who is paying them. But everyone else in that, uh, in that supply chain doesn't, get, doesn't benefit from better uh, visibility. And even for the, the OEM or whoever it is who's contracted them, they've still got to get on the phone. You know, you might have your, um, your uh, watchtower you might get have this perfect visibility of your supply chain, but if your trucker doesn't, you're still going to have to get on the phone and call them or send them an email or whatever. So really, it solves a problem, but it solves a problem for you, but not for anyone else in the supply chain. Um, with the data ownership, of course, all of that data from what each of those parties coming through a, a central database um, leaves it open to the possibility that that data can be cleaned, mined, and sold. Um, and you know, every year we get more and more concerned with data privacy. Companies and people don't want their data being sold, uh, even if it's been anonymized. Um, and of course, the data sharing, as I mentioned, is point to point. Data comes in, uh, but really it just goes to the client uh, and the security is standard encryption. What we do is we decentralize that whole network. So instead of pulling all of that information into a central database, each of those nodes around the outside that you can represents either an internal system or a um, or a third party in the supply chain but they're all connected into a network but at the same time that data isn't being pulled through a centralized database the data can for each node we can either help provide a uh, um, a cloud computing service for that or you can even host your node in your own cloud and we're completely cloud agnostic and we can build networks with people in and different uh parties and systems in different clouds. So your data stays on your database. Um, and it's it's only the uh, the data that you want to be shared that gets seen uh, by others. As Venturus, we actually have no access to our clients' data. We provide the network solution, but we at no point have control or see it or have the data that comes through our, our database. And of course, with the point to any uh, data sharing, this is a huge benefit. Because what it means is that you can set up in the program layer that sits on top of the um, the network, you can set up data sharing rules. So it means that if a say I'll use a um, a car example because that's the, the latest um, business case that I've been working with uh, with clients. Say a vessel that's coming from Germany with a whole load of cars is coming into Philadelphia, and um, it's going to be two days late. Now. If that information is shared only to the manufacturer of those vehicles, 
then that's great. I and mean, they, they have the information, but then they've got to call the port. They've got to call the truckers. They've got to call the rail. With our network solution, you can, or you can set your data sharing rules. So if relevant data becomes available or something changes, all of the parties who need to know, know it immediately in real time. So it means that say that vessel's coming in two days late, and that means that uh, a whole load of truckers who've been arrived, who've been arranged to come and pick up those cars from port, they're going to turn up too early and there's going to be no cars. They can be informed automatically. You don't need to send an email. You don't need to make a phone call. That all happens and it's all harmonized within the network and according to your business rules. Um, so that is really the, the core benefit of interoperability and of our network solution. Beyond that, and I know this was in the title of, uh, of this, uh, this talk, is really the security aspect, which is that data security, be that from being hacked or even just data, you know, your resilience of your supply chain. At the moment, with there are a lot of bottlenecks in logistics and supply chain, a lot of systems that um, all of the information flows through. What we have done with um, within the network, and I'll come on to this, is we it means that all of this data is decentralized, so there's no uh, there's sort of key dependencies for it, but also it's with a double layer of encryption. It means it is very, 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 very hard to uh, to hack and get access to information, um, and it would it would require a, a supercomputer to break one of these nodes. Um, and if you could break one of the nodes, then it would be rejected by the uh, by the network. So really building safety into this uh, solution as well um, was, was a big part of um, what we wanted to do. And of course, it's something that just comes as standard with blockchain. So um, that was uh, that was great. Yeah, next slide, please. What's up? So um, we've got that right hand um, uh, graph there. Um, and this is really just zooming in on it and showing what we can do. So at the top there is the uh, is the client. In this case, we put OEM, original equipment manufacturer, which is the, the jargon for say a vehicle manufacturer, like whoever it may be, Mitsubishi. Um, and, uh, and they are what we like to call the conductor orchestra. They're the one that gets to set the data sharing rules. They're the ones who get to see the entirety of the data because it's all relevant to them. Um, and they get to choose who, who and when sees that data. Um, so who can we connect? We can connect different entities, countries, um, component suppliers, assembly plants, LSPs, logistic service providers. So this can be truckers, rail providers, um, this can be shipping lines. It can be literally anyone, even airlines. Anyone who has a system, we can integrate it. We can do integrate third-party applications uh, for internal systems. So um, CRM, um, customer relationship management systems, TMS, which is like a transport management system, WMS, warehouse management systems. All of these big companies have different uh, third-party solutions that they use for solving individual problems or individual um, uh, spaces of their business. And we can integrate all of those. And we've actually got pre-built plugins for um, for Salesforce, for um, all sorts of different um, uh, existing applications. So we can plug them in really quickly. Um, container terminals, custom, even customs brokers, you know, we can integrate with them directly. So all of the documentation, every move of the, of the item as it's moved through the supply chain, they can be. Uh, um, everything in one place, um, and even sustainability and industry standards. So, of course, the benefit of having this single source of truth for your data, where you've got everyone connected, you're pulling in data from all these different sources. Um, what it means is that now you've got data of every single move of every single item in your supply chain, and it means that you can now start calculating your carbon footprint, not only on per item basis or on a per container basis or whatever it may be, but on a per move basis, um, so you can get a lot more granular. Um, and of course, telemetry and Internet of Things, IoT devices, uh, these have been in cars for a while. So just the, the GPS tracking that you can have in cars. Uh, but we've seen with um, companies like Hapagloid, they've been putting uh, IoT devices on shipping containers as well. So essentially, 
bringing in live data and to enrich all of the data that we're getting from the parties like trucking companies, shipping companies, uh, port facilities, all of that data being enriched with live tracking data too um, means that you've got this incredibly rich um, single source of truth. And everyone who needs the data within the network can see it in real time um, if it's relevant to them. And that's chosen by the client. Uh, next. Next up. Um, so did we choose uh, Hyperledger uh, Fabric? Um, essentially, logistics data is just very long chains of events um, and evolve a limited number of parties to start with. Um, so uh, each, essentially, it involves a lot of parties, but each individual event is generally just involving two, maybe three parties. So if you imagine a, a rolls off a production line in Munich and it's got to get all the way to a dealership in Ohio, there's a huge number of people who are gonna to touch that vehicle, a huge number of systems it's gonna work, going work its way through. But each move, each event that happens from leaving the factory to it re, uh, arriving in Ohio is essentially a very, very small um, uh, event or transaction and it happens so it might be a um a truck picking that up from the factory so there you've got the factory handing it over and the truck picking it up or down the line it'd be a um the vessel that's moved it across the sea discharging it to a port so what you see is there's a lot of events that happen but they're not always uh they're not always relevant for everyone in the supply chain um, and also, quite often, when you're dealing with lots of different trucking partners um, who might be doing different parts of a move, the parties involved in your supply chain can be competitors as well. So we had to be very, very aware of how logistics works and what we wanted people to see and what we... So we needed to create a data sharing environment that it allowed this level of confidentiality when it came to individual events while still being verified and decentralized. Um, but still needed to have that ability within the network to share relevant data um, to other parties who might need to see it. So essentially, how could we work with these channels um, and these bilateral or multilateral contracts that can be uh, that can be done in Hyperledger? How could we use that to um, to solve this problem? And what we thought is really when it comes to to blockchain, any solution that requires all nodes, everyone in the transaction maintain the chain not only would this be very slow um, and hard to scale and of course this wouldn't be able to accommodate the, the bilateral contracts that we needed but also as i said you might have four five six different trucking companies in your network who are technical competitors and you don't want them all having visibility of each other's business so you wanted to have that level of partitioning while also having the ability to share data um, between participants um and uh, when it came to Hyperledger Fabric, really, um, I mean, industry standard. Um, we we also were very early early um, adopters. Um, we uh, we had um, we started out in 2017 building on Hyperledger, um, but it was really also the um, the ability for us to um, uh, to work with these bilateral contracts to also have that scalability in, and because it's open source, the ability for us to operate, um, to operate within, um, within our own, within what we could build. We didn't want constraints. Um, and it really just, it being so modular and scalable was a, uh, another great reason for us to, um, to use Hyperledger Fabric. Um, next slide. Slide six. Thank you. Um, so, um, oh, I see this is actually, uh, this isn't the most updated, uh, um, presentation, so I will send you the up updates. Um, but, um, yeah, so essentially we've seen, uh, what, who sees what within this, um, within these channels, what we've managed to do is to build out a, um, a, to build out different nodes, which can, and each node can, can host multiple parties and within one channel to be able to handle uh, part parties and also to have levels of
confidentiality, even within one channel. Um, and when it came to data security, um, using public keys and private keys to separate um, the, the data visibility, even within shared nodes, was, um, was really how we built out this ability to um, have access to the, uh, the public data, um, but also to, to have that level of uh, confidentiality um, so different parties could, um, uh, could only see what was relevant to them. Um, and so having asset, assets um, encrypted with set keys, um, but, and then the asset essentially having a, being encrypted with a public keyhole so that it, you needed a private key to unencrypt asset keys. And then you can see the transactions using that to, to, to create that level of confidentiality. And of course, no sharing of keys is possible outside the network. Um, for security. Uh, next slide. Slide seven. Um, so we wanted to make this really scalable. Uh, so we built out our um, our uh, our blockchain and, and the way we handle all of our um, our work with Kubernetes infrastructure. So essentially build that resilience and scalability into our networks. Um, and we use Rancher 2. Um, we have periodic snapshots of the blockchain to back up. So we've every hour, um, we, we have a, a, um, a snapshot, which means it's easy backup uh, and easy restoring if needs be. And uh, because Kubernetes operates um, with multiple instances or replicas, uh, it means that whenever we did up um, updates, we could always do that live. We wouldn't have to have downtime uh, and roll out changes incrementally. And documentation, of course, in logistics and supply chain, there are endless PDFs, JPGs, we imagine spreadsheets that um, are required. This is a very physical business um, that we're trying to digitize. So because of that, we did not want to have all of these stored in the, in the chain because it's going to just bog down all of our computing power. It's going to cost a lot. So instead, what we have is an encrypted hash um, of the location um, of the document. Um, and then any party with the asset key for that transaction can download that on demand. So really, that's how we, we've, uh, we've got around that. Not everyone always needs to see all documents. So that way, it means that, say, uh, a receiving party needs to see the bill of lading, which is the paper document that comes um, when you pick up a, a load, um, that that would be available to them for download uh, through the network, but it would only be downloaded if they required it. And each document has a cryptographic token signature as well. So when it comes to all the metadata that is important, you know, when was this uploaded, whom, et cetera, that's also um, uh, in the network. Next slide, thank you. Slide eight. So really, um, coming on to the, uh, the logistics and supply chain. So what is it that we do uh, practically um, with, uh, with our blockchain and, and with Hyperledger? So every party in the logistics chain um, uh, relies on data for planning business operations. So everything that happens, you've got to have the information um, in order to do it properly, particularly since there's so many people involved in these, in these chains. Um, and reliable uh, ETAs, so estimated time of arrivals, um, but also just reliable data is needed to keep waiting customers satisfied. So if you're a, a guy who's pre-ordered a, um, a BMW in Ohio, you want to be able to know where that is, um, or at least the dealership needs to know exactly what the status of that is in order to keep you happy. Um, logistics data is highly sensitive, and as I mentioned, currently highly vulnerable. Whenever you're emailing spreadsheets of sensitive data, the second you click send, that's gone out into the ether and you don't have any control of it anymore. You just hope that, that it won't get shared to the wrong people. But with logistics, you just you just don't know. A lot of people are seeing these things and um, a lot of big companies have, have seen a lot of theft. Um, it's been rising in the industry over the last few years. Um, and really, if you're emailing out spreadsheets with container numbers, the train that they're going to be on, the contents, and who owns the contents. Suddenly, if someone sees, oh, there's a whole load of um, super expensive Nike trainers, Nike sneakers, 
um, and it's going to be on this train at this time in this container, uh, it makes it very easy uh, to to rob them. So uh, this has a, a, been a big problem, and it's something that we're solving as well. And next slide. Bye time. So uh, poor data sharing and security, as I mentioned, are um, are, are big um, issues. Uh, oops, sorry, back one. Thank you. Um, and uh, and the costs are not just limited to to financial costs. You've got business costs too. So walking away because they say, well, where's my stuff? And how come you don't know? Um, time spent on calls with frustrated partners. So this could be, um, a, as I mentioned, a trucker who's turned up at the port to pick up a load and the load hasn't even come in yet. And they sit there, they're angry because they, they're like, I could have been making money running full loads. Um, and I'm now going to have to bill you waiting time. Uh, and instead you're, you're uh, now paying waiting times and they're frustrated saying, well, why didn't you tell me? And the truth is that if, if all of this is manual and if say someone in the, uh, in head office learned that the vessel was coming in two days late, but they were sick that day or they, their email inbox went down or they just forgot to make the call. There's a thousand and one reasons why someone cannot receive the data that they need. And so automating it just makes so much sense. Um, of course, last minute discovery of issues as well. Um, I'll get onto that in, um, in a sec. Say a, uh, a vehicle being transported on a truck gets pinged by a rock uh, in Germany and the driver of the truck can take responsibility and say, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pay for that. But then that vehicle moves all the way along. And really it's when it gets received in Philadelphia that someone says, well, we can't send it to the dealership like this. Now we've got to schedule the body shop. Now we've got to order a new part in the right color. Um, and now this car has got to sit at the port for three weeks, waiting for that part to come in and for the body shop to free up. If, if as soon as that, that ding on the car was, was noticed in Germany, if that information was shared immediately in real time with the receiving port in Philly, they could have already scheduled the body shop. They could have already ordered the part in the right color. And it means that everything moves much more smoothly. Um, of course, operations team in permanent crisis mode. Um, I, I come from an operations background, so I, I can confirm. Uh, this is essentially uh, an issue for most teams out there in, in logistics and supply chain. Things go wrong. This is a physical business um, and balls get dropped, things get damaged. And so the, the better the data and the making sure that everyone has the data when they need it just means that you're not fighting fires that have already become raging infernos before you notice them. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, risk of increased cargo crime, um, that's a big business cost for um, uh, for poor data security. On the financial cost, just generally everything that you have in a supply chain is is financed by someone or it's, uh, it, it's sitting on a financing floor plan, particularly with vehicles. Uh, so you want things to move fast. You don't want things to be sitting in a supply chain um, and not moving. Of course, trucks uh, and railhead half loads uh, instead of full loads. If you don't know when th when things are getting to where they need to be or where they are, um, you're just going to say, right, well, we got to get this lot out now. Um, oh, sorry, back one. Um, and so uh, you end up just using your logistics partners in a um and you're still paying them uh, the full amount, but they're not getting the uh, they're not getting you're not getting the benefit. Um, of course, as I mentioned, trucking companies billing for waiting times if they've turned up for things that aren't there. Um, companies are, are renting land or warehouse space. Um, and uh, if you cannot have a, a really rigorous grip on where things are going to be at what time, you always have to rent more land than you need as, a, as a, an emergency overflow. And so you're just not getting ROI. Um, return on investment on that rental if you're if you're renting too much and you're not using it the whole time, uh, and of course highly uh, highly expensive insurance if you keep having your stuff stolen um, with cargo crime. As I mentioned, like logistics is is a physical industry. We're moving we're moving things usually very expensive large things, uh, and things inevitably go wrong. Um, the idea is that when they do, if you've got been if you're using the interoperable network, you can prevent 
frustration across the board because everyone has automatic real-time updates for the data that's relevant to them. Um, and also, of course, hyper-secure data so that you, whenever you share data, you know it's only going to be seen by the people who really need it on a no basis. You're not going to have data just going out into public. And of course, it means you can get back on schedule with automated early warning and proactive planning. So the idea being that if, uh, if that ding on the car in Germany um, was flagged up immediately instead of just popping up at the last minute, uh, you, could you could deal with that proactively and get ahead of the problem instead of having to deal with issues only once as said, they've, uh, they've gone from small fires to raging infernos. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a time check here, uh, Alex, that we have nine minutes left. So I mean, we, okay. we will- I'll, uh, I'll, I'll speak through. through. Uh, they've not got much left. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is essentially uh, the container version of that car thing that I described. Um, say uh, there's two containers here, uh, container one, container two, coming out of a, um, a plant in, in the States. They go on rail to the port, but somewhere on, um, on the the way something happens to that container uh maybe it's not critical that it can keep moving but it before it goes to the end customer it needs to be transshipped into a um another container so immediately that information is shared with the receiving port in germany the container can move onwards and when it arrives in germany immediately um it, there's uh, another container waiting for it to be transshipped also, they recognize that that's going to take time. It's going to miss its onbound, its onward journey on the container barge. So they've already organized an alternative um, logistic service provider to take it to the final destination. And hopefully, it can get there at the same time as the original one, maybe just slightly delayed. So that's really a, a practical application. And this is what we're seeing again and again uh, with our clients. Uh, next slide. Slide 11. So um, yeah, I mean, accurate data and secure data, um, it, the benefits are, are pretty self-explanatory. A single source of truth for all logistics data is huge. Um, I mean, everyone's talking about AI right now, but AI is as good as the data that you feed it. Um, and by connecting everyone and by having this network effect, um, you, you've now got one place um, for all your data and no longer are people operating from different truths, um, often with shipping, one party will say it's arriving in four days, the port will think it's arriving in three, and the client thinks it's arriving in, in seven. Everyone's got different uh, a different source of truth. Now everyone can sing from the same hymn sheet. Of course, with, um, with blockchain, the immutable, unfalsifiable nature of it is great, particularly with logistics, because it means that it, it takes all of the question marks out. When something happened, you have the timestamp, and no one can change it. When a photo is uploaded of damage, you know exactly when and by whom it was uploaded. It's not just a JPEG attached to an email. Um, as I mentioned, real-time automatic updates for all relevant parties. And another thing is, is harmonization and uh, uh, um, route changing um, within logistics. So now because everyone's connected, instead of having to email and call a thousand people when you need to switch a load from rail to trucks, uh, you have to call the, the rail company, cancel the order, call the truck company, place the order, call the receiving uh, location to tell them it's coming on truck instead of rail, tell the, um, the leaving location that it's going to be picked up on truck instead of rail. Everyone's involved within with the network uh, using um, Venturus. With a few clicks of a button, you just say, right, this is going on truck now. Immediately, everyone's informed. The orders are canceled with the rail. The orders are placed with the truck, and both of the ports are, are um, informed. So suddenly everything, accurate data in real time for everyone, just strips out all of the manual work that people would have to be doing on the phone or via email. And with data security, everything's on a need to know basis. Um, so the data is only shared to those who need to see it, uh, not to everyone. Um, this also gives people security. A lot of parties are often not very, they're a bit reticent to share their data, but now they know it's a secure location, a secure environment, and it's only gonna be seen by people who need to see it. So that's uh, that gives them um, a greater sense of security. Of course, the level of encryption and that, net that network effect, meaning no bot data bottlenecks and no single points of reliance that can go down and pull the whole network down. Uh, next slide. 
Line 12. Uh, and this is the last one. Uh, essentially, this is how this is. These are the big four points that I say to potential clients. Essentially, we make an immediate ROI for you. We've been shown to save between three and ten dollars um, per uh, per shipment um, for for clients. Um, so it's per per shipped unit. So say that could be a vehicle or a container or whatever it may be. Um, and uh, we chart, we cost less than that. So we within your first year, you'll see a full ROI uh, by using our, our network solution. We don't overhaul. We're not coming in to try and change everything that our clients are doing. We build a parallel system around the outside. So, and we we do all of the work. So we plug in all of your systems. Your systems, if they've been speaking to other systems to to you know on peer to peer API calls to to run um, to run things for now, they can keep doing that. But around the outside, we're building that single source of truth. Um, and often after twelve months, sometimes even six months. Our clients see the um, see opportunities to stop the uh, to stop using existing uh, tech stacks and, and transition across, but that's not how they need to from the beginning. We do all of the implementation in house. We don't outsource this. We do everything ourselves. We really just need some time with subject matter experts within the client's company. But this is no extra um, resources required from their IT team. We do all of the heavy lifting, and we work super quick. We've done implementations historically in between between four to six months um so full implementation so we can move really quickly um i know there's a few questions so i'll stop there um and uh yeah i'll have a look and see i think they're in the chat right okay thank you alex for uh, sharing i'll i got the questions here the first one do you see channel management to be concerned as the network grows um, no, so I mean, so what we're not doing is a um, is building it a a large public network. So this isn't like an ecosystem for everyone. What this is is a, um, uh, a an individual network per client. So we we do this on a, a client by client basis. Um, of course, if we've implemented X trucking company for Mitsubishi, if we then have to implement them again for another party, that's super quick. So of course there is that level of um, of scalability that it, it becomes easier, but essentially for each client we they have their own separate network, and so no that 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 channel issue doesn't become a, a problem. Okay, good. Next question: How large are your data sets? Well, it, again, it all entirely depends on how large the client is and and what their needs are. Um, we operate with some some new uh, sort of. Particularly in the EV space, some some uh, some smaller clients um, who are just scaling up. So of course the data sets are small, smaller. But then with bigger clients, with more trucking partners, more you know, we can uh, the data sets can get pretty large. Um, yeah, but of course the the, the larger the data set um, and the the more historical data that's in the network, the more effectively you can use um, AI or optimization. And you can use that single source of truth um, to to start, say, um, yeah, it's using AI generated uh, estimated times of arrivals and things like that. In maybe a different way, are we talking megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes? You know, what maybe just give it an order of magnitude. Um, I would have to defer that question to uh, our CTO. I'm afraid I haven't. I I, I don't deal with uh with okay <laughs> exactly. Okay. Let's go. Next question: Where is the data that is hashed stored? So the data that is hashed is stored on on whichever um, uh, database that node is is um, it resides on. So say that say the the client has chosen to host the node on their own cloud, then that it would stay in their cloud and it would be downloaded from there. Uh, sometimes with say for trucking partners uh, for these big manufacturers, they're not going to have their own systems. So what we do is we set up a um, we set up a node to host all of them, um, and in that case, say it was a PDF document that um, was uploaded by a trucking partner who just dropped off a car, um, that would be hosted in that database, and then upon demand um, for anyone who would who has the transaction key, they could just I mean the asset key, uh, they could um, download that from there. Okay, got it. Last one. What is the uh, pricing model? Pricing model is um, is pretty flexible. Uh, we generally, I mean, we're a SaaS company, so generally we do an annual an annual um, 
license fee uh, that is relatively low, but then we do a, um, a unit by unit cost. So say uh, the best example is with cars coming from Germany to uh, US dealerships. For each vehicle that we move all the way from factory to the end um, to the end dealership, uh, there's a, a fixed cost, um, which would be, I don't know, say one dollar or whatever. I mean, it, it entirely depends on how complex yeah. the logistics um, yeah. uh, legs are. But um, yeah, we don't charge per per individual event. We charge full length of move. Beautiful. Okay. Um, to keep our value proposition, we're going to stop now here. Alex, uh, we have your email. Are you okay if we put that on the wiki so that people who have additional questions can uh, uh, email Please. you? Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, Alicia, I'll send you the updated um, uh, presentation right. because I think the one that hadn't yet updated, um, it's it's essentially identical. There's a couple of um, of uh, things that I'd fixed. Thank you. Keep an eye area. Out. Beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. So, Folks, thanks for sticking with, with us through a few of the technical difficulties at the beginning. If you are uh, here live, if you're on uh, YouTube, you missed it all. So that's that's good. And you get a little trouble. <laughs> but uh, lots of good stuff here from Alex. Lots of good stuff uh, from Venturas uh, for you know folks to think about. I, I had probably five or six more questions here. So I'm sure there's more. It sounds like Alex will be able to get some answers, or if not, he can go back to uh, the folks within their team there. So Alex, thank you very much for sharing Venturas here. Um, thanks everybody for joining today, whether you're listening live, joining us live, or whether you're listening on YouTube. And with that, have a great rest of the day, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. Yeah. Alex, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. We got a lot out of it. Bye. My pleasure.